Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Brent Phillips. I'm the Managing Director for IntelliMagic, who is sponsoring this webinar. Um, I've got with me as well two other names that uh, perhaps some of you have have uh, heard about in your experience with, with IBM mainframes. Joe Hyde is going to be doing uh, two sections of the presentation today. Um, Joe's been with IntelliMagic about a, a year now uh, after spending 32 years with IBM focusing on uh, high-end disk, uh, disk performance. Um, he's got, uh, I think, over about 20 pat patents as well in the area of um, disk storage performance design and uh, uh, has over 12 years of experience with uh, disk performance for non-mainframe sites as well. So we're pleased to have Joe um, presenting. Uh, along with Joe is Paulus Usong, and some of you in the Americas region may be familiar with his name as well. He's uh, joined IntelliMagic this spring after spending uh, about 30 years with IBM. Uh, he was in the Advanced Technical Support Group focused on the Americas region, uh, providing uh, pre-sales and post-sales technical support for ZOS customers, um, doing various studies, for example, ZHPF analysis, which is one of the things we'll talk about today. And, he also uh, co-authored a red book on uh, the topic of DS8000 performance and tuning uh, that you may have seen. So we're, we're pleased to be able to present this content to you today and to have these, these uh, presenters. So here's the agenda of what we're talking about today. I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of a big picture background for you um, about who IntelliMagic is, why we're uh, doing this presentation today, and what is the technology that was used to create the case studies that we're talking about. So after those uh, introductory slides, uh, Paulus will uh, present the case study on uh, ZHPF projections. And this is really designed to answer the question about uh, uh, channel configuration and the ramifications of ZHPF on that. Uh, Joe will then take over and, and talk about uh, measuring uh, the, a site that has implemented ZHPF and showing the before and after impact uh, for their workloads of, of implementing ZHPF and then go into the case study on the coupling facility uh, problem analysis or efficiency analysis, which had, uh, in this particular case, um, some significant ramifications on the CPU side. So it's an interesting case study. So a little bit about IntelliMagic. We are, um, we consider ourselves anyway, a leader in what we call um, advanced predictive analytics, especially for large uh, storage infrastructures. That's what most people are familiar with IntelliMagic um, uh, about, is our, our ability to look inside um, DASD on the mainframe, or we do it also for uh, SAN environments on the open systems side, to be able to give uh, early warning for when the peak period workloads are, are approaching the capabilities of the hardware, these kind of things. And obviously, this presentation is in other areas, and it's an illustration of how we've expanded the product. But we've been doing what we've been doing for over 20 years, actually. We're a small, privately held company. Um, we consider ourselves very responsive to customer requests and uh, have actually a, a lot of very happy customers that include some of the largest um, uh, mainframe sites in, in the country, uh, including four out of five of the largest banks and um, wireless providers and insurance companies and so on and so forth. So uh, our product, uh, primary product that we'll be um, using in today's um, analysis is called IntelliMagic Vision, and there's different, different modules uh, available. One of them will, of course, um, look into the the ZHPF workloads and coupling facility uh, workloads. So we'll, we'll show you a lot of samples uh, about that. Um, just a couple of words about the, the difference that IntelliMagic Vision uh, offers when we're, we're doing our analysis. I mean, everybody's been using uh, different tools and, and capabilities, SAS and MXG, for example, for many, many years, um, and are very familiar with the, the classical data presentation is, is what we uh, call it. Uh, but with this, it, it, it's difficult to know really where, where to look. You have to be an expert, and of course, everybody's workload has increased and staffing levels have decreased, and the complexity and size of the environment you manage has, has typically increased. So it, it makes it uh, really impractical to use these kind of reporting tools to proactively avoid problems. I mean, you'll, uh, they can be very useful if you know what to look for when you're drilling down for, uh, you know, discover a problem. 
Uh, but we, we feel that there is a need in the market to uh, incorporate more intelligence into uh, the data analysis and the summary of, of, of uh, what, what you're looking at. So this is our approach with IntelliMagic Vision where we mine the data, we use rules and a knowledge base about what's good and bad to be able to summarize uh, risk and the health of the status of, uh, of the environment. Um, looking at both you know the logical views as well as the physical views and tying those together grouping uh, relevant reports together is is one of the types of intelligence that's built into uh, how we how we look at the data and providing uh, recommendations so that's that's our approach with IntelliMagic vision and one way to look at what we're doing is actually restoring the original intent of uh, RMF on the mainframe of course when it was first introduced uh, the infrastructure was a lot different than it is now. Things have been expanded so much where you know the amount of uh, RMF data that's produced in your environments on a lot of different uh, ZOS resources is just uh, you know is very voluminous and it's it's hard to um, see what's really important out of all of that data. And so the, the from our perspective, uh, the original intent was to 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 have RMF serve as a as a source of proactive knowledge about how the ZOS resources are performing. And to get back that, to that intent is, is one of the things that we feel that uh, we're able to do with the IntelliMagic Vision uh, solution by incorporating this uh, um, additional knowledge and intelligence about uh, the hardware infrastructure in with the data um, and, and with all the automation capabilities. So one of the key ways that that shows up is uh, in this um, uh, dashboard kind of view. So there's a lot of different dashboards in the product with uh, what we call key risk indicators, not just a key performance indicator, which would um, help you understand when a problem is already happening. But actually, the intent is to give early warning by changing some of the key metrics to uh, to yellow, for example, um, to indicate that even though your response times are fine just now, we feel that the infrastructure actually is stressed or has that the risk of the infrastructure to handle your peak period workloads has grown to an unacceptable level. And if you can deal with it when it's in that yellow stage, then you could avoid it going to uh, you know, a, a red dot or a bigger red dot as the problem gets more, more severe. So that's kind of the intent and to be able to, to give you a visibility into your uh, infrastructure where in just uh, 30 seconds or so you could, you could see is there an issue um, that should be investigated or not, and then to be able to quickly drill down and, and get to the very detailed uh, metrics of, uh, of relevant information for that particular issue. So to do the uh, analysis today in these case studies, we've, uh, we've used IntelliMagic Vision. Uh, it collects a variety of information, I mean primarily RMF and SMF data, but uh, some other sources that, that you see on the screen there. Um, we have different modules for the product to focus on different areas. This, what we're doing today is really in what we would call our systems or server module of IntelliMagic Vision to focus on uh, the ZHPF and the, and the coupling facility uh, reports. But we, we bring it all into a database. Uh, we enrich the data, uh, validate it, and consolidate it, and, and apply our rules and customizations, and, and then generate reports and have some visibility via uh, Windows or, or Web GUI. Um, this will be available in the in the deck. Uh, there's, uh, we'll send out a recording of this presentation if you're just interested in the kind of records that we produce. Most of these we do have these dashboards for these different areas of, uh, of course, the DASD uh, environment, um, replication dashboards for channels and FICOMs as well, and processors and so on and so forth. We do incorporate um, job records and data set records to uh, help understand uh, what. You know, why issues occur. Um, it's available through the drill, drill downs. and uh, So there's a, that's obviously a lot of data and uh, we really work hard to make it uh, in an intelligent format to make it easy to, to figure out what's going on. And one final comment uh, before we launch into the case studies is about uh, um, how you can access this. Uh, we, we do offer it uh, not only as a classical software that you can install on-premise, but uh, also as a service, so this makes it very easy, uh, actually within 24 hours in, in most cases, to start getting uh, this kind of visibility from, from your environment. And you can also do it in a short-term engagement, so we, we often will go into a site and do a, 
kind of a, an assessment or uh, over a, a shorter time period. And it, it allows us to, to um, use some of our experts like Joe and, and Paulus to be looking at your data and serve as a, an additional resource for your environment uh, as well. So with that, uh, I think we'll, Gwen, if you could uh, transfer control of the screen over to Paulus, and we'll launch into the first case study. Okay, thank you, Brent. Uh, we will start with the CSPF part of our web of our webinar today. What topics related to CSPF will we cover in our presentation today? We will present two case studies. Uh, in, each, in, <clears throat> in each case, we'll show you examples of what IntelliMagic can do to help you in your CSPF decision and evaluation. The case study number one is a pre-analysis before you implement CSPF. What we'll do is we will analyze your current workload and estimate the percentage of CSPF candidate IOs by this subsystem. This we will use our entire magic vision product, um, and, and then we will recommend channel consolidation to use fewer channels uh, because we will be using CHPF. This will be applicable when doing CAC consolidation and or when upgrading or consolidating DSS. And then um, I will present the case study number one, and case study number two will be presented by Joe Hyde. Uh, basically, this will compare the before and after CSPF is activated. Okay, it will. We will get uh, what you need to provide us is data before CSPF is turned on, and then data after CSPF is turned on. Okay, what do we need to analyze the data? Basically, we need SMF data type 42 and RMF uh, data type 70 through 78, preferably uh, one week's amount of data. What I will show here is I'll show what we did with one day of SMF data, and we'll analyze that one day of data. It shows the current CAC configuration that we're analyzing. There are three CACs. I call them CAC1, CAC2, and CAC3. And there are three disk subsystems. I call them ABC11, ABC16, and ABC17. ABC16 and ABC17 are DC chain, meaning they are accessed by the, through the same channels from each CAC. So just to clarify here, each red line is showing an uh, eight-channel path. So for example, from CAC1 to ABC11, there is an eight-channel path going, uh, connecting CAC1 to ABC11, and there is another eight-channel path connecting CAC1 to ABC16 and ABC17. CAC2 and CAC3 basically has the same channel configuration as CAC1. In fact, uh, in this particular case, uh, CAC2 and CAC3 uses the same channel numbers as CAC1. This just shows the I.O. rate for the day. Uh, the x-axis is the date and time, so this is the 24-hour report, and the y-axis is the I.O.s per second. Here we see that uh, ABC11 is showing up here as a red line, has a peak I.O. rate of about 90,000 I.O.s a second, and ABC16 and ABC17 combined together because they are they are DC chain has a total IO rate of about a hundred thousand IOs a second. Uh, I will discuss the CHPF candidate uh, based on the IO rate by day. But before before I go into this detail, let me explain this first. Um, I used to work for IBM until a few months ago, and when I was at IBM, I was responsible to do the CHPF analysis. At that time, I used a tool written using SAS code to determine the percentage of IOs that are CHPF candidates. Uh, with IntelliMagic, we are using the IntelliMagic Fission product to determine how much of the IOs are CHPF candidates, as shown on this chart here. And basically, 
this is a new and improved tool compared to the CHTF analysis tool that I use at IBM. What this graph shows is uh, the average I.O. rate for the day. These numbers are calculated based on the data from SMF 542. Let's look at ABC 11 here. ABC 11, the average I.O. rate by day is uh, about 49,000 hours a second, out of which uh, 46,000 are CHPF candidate I.O. rate and about 3,000 are CHPF non-candidate I.O. rates. By the way, um, this CHPF candidate I.O. rate is calculated based on CHPF phase one capabilities. Um, IBM has announced two phases of CHTF. We call, uh, IBM calls it phase zero and phase one. Uh, the big difference between phase zero and phase one is that phase one supports sequential access method, so which is good for your batch period. Uh, next page, percent CHPF eligible IOs. Uh, let's look at ABC 11 here. It shows that the CHPF candidate I.O. rate for ABC 11 is 46,000 I.O.s a second and the average I.O. rate is 55,000 I.O.s a second. If you remember what was shown on the previous page, actually the previous page shows that it's about 49,000. So why am I showing 55,000 here? The reason is because um, SMF type 42 apparently does not capture every single I.O. Um, and so this 55,000 is taken from the SMF record type 74. So if we calculate the percent CHPF I.O., we calculate 46,000 divided by 55,000, that comes up to be 83%. So 83% of the I.O.s are um, CHPF candidate I.O.s or another term we use is uh, CHPF eligible IOs. Uh, ABC 16 and 17 combined together has a percent CHPF IO of 57%. So basically um, an IO is considered uh, CHPF, it depends on the data set type and also depends on the type of IO. This shows the plan, okay, so we have uh, CAC 1, CAC 2, and CAC 3, and the plan, uh, the customer's plan was to consolidate CAC 1, CAC 2, and CAC 3 into one new CAC. So that's what I'm showing here as consolidated CAC. Um, what I'm showing here is just looking at ABC 16 and ABC 17. I'm not going to show you the analysis for ABC 11. The reason is because the percent CHPF I.O. on ABC 16 and ABC 17 is only about 50% compared to the percent CHPF I.O. on ABC 11, which is 80%. So it's more interesting to look at what will happen if the percent CHPF I.O. is, is slower. Right? Um, so here we have uh, eight channel path from CAC 1 going to ABC 16 and 17, another 8-channel path from CAC 2, and another 8-channel path from CAC 3. Um, what we are trying to suggest is we will do a 3 to 1 channel consolidation. So the 3 8-channel path will be consolidated to only one 8-channel path which will result that the consolidated CAC will access ABC 16 and ABC 17 through only one 8-channel path. Okay. So the question is, is it safe, is it possible um, in terms of uh, channel performance? Next page, um, JPEG configuration. So as I mentioned before, CAC 1, CAC 2, CAC 3 accesses ABC 16 and ABC 17 through the following channels, it's channels 18 through 1 Fox. What the consolidation suggestion that we want to uh, to propose is 
uh, let's say channel 18 from CAC 1, channel 18 from CAC 2, and channel 18 from CAC 3 will be combined into one channel so that there will be one new channel on the consolidated CAC. So as a result, there will be only eight channels from the consolidated, from the consolidated CAC that will access ABC 16 and ABC 17. And of course, uh, the plan is to activate the HPF. So this is the result of the channel consolidation study. This study, this uh, projection, this analysis is done using the IBM CCP3002. Um, let's look at the results here. So we're trying to combine three channels into one channel. Uh, without CHPF, if we combine the three channels onto one channel, uh, you will see that the total channel utilization here peaks at about 37 percent. That is, we do not uh, activate CHPF. But if we activate CHPF, which in this case we'll be using a projection based on 50 percent CHPF eligible, uh, we'll see that the projected channel utilization peak is only 23 uh, percent, which is um, quite an improvement considering we only have 50 percent of the IOs are CHPF eligible, um, which will give a longer lifespan for this channel because, as you know, the rule of thumb for channel utilization is 50 percent. If your channel utilization reaches 50%, you will get a, a performance degradation because the channel are saturated. So um, without CHPF, you're already at 37%, and in a couple of years, it would, with, the, with your workload growth, it will definitely start to reach 50%, while if you have CHPF active, you will have a longer lifespan for the channel. So this is the projection based on 50% CHPF. The next foil, I'm trying to do the projection based on 80% CHPF. I know this ABC 11 and ABC 16 and ABC 17 do not have this 80% CHPF eligible characteristics, but what I'm trying to show here is um, what will happen if the uh, percent CHPF IOs are 80 percent of the total IOs. We see here that the blue line is the same as the, the, the line on the practice chart. Without CHPF, it's 37 percent peak, but with CHPF, it becomes only about 15 percent, which is uh, less than half of what this original uh, utilization is. Um, the next file. Uh, this is my last file. Um, this is just a summary of what I've uh, shown before. So, with CS 50% CHPF, uh, with 50% CHPF eligible IOs, the 3 to 1 channel consolidation shows the following. The peak utilization will improve from 37% to 23%. If the workload characteristics on ABC 16 and 17 were the same as the characteristics of the workload on ABC 11, which been 80 percent the HPF eligible IOs, the consolidation shows the following. Peak channel utilization decreased by more than half from 37 percent to 15 percent. So basically what this study shows is, um, yes, you can do a 3 to 1 channel consolidation, and with the HPF, uh, this configuration is safe, meaning uh, Performance-wise, it is uh, a good choice because your, your peak channel utilization here, even with 50% CHPF, will be only 23%, which is uh, low enough to allow for growth in the future. Um, that's all that I have. Uh, the next presentation will be presented by Joe Hyde. Uh, hello, everyone. It's Joe Hyde. Al. Uh, Paulus did projections for ZHPF. This is an actual customer data with uh, before and after ZHPF uh, performance. So with that said, let me go down. And first of all, uh, Paulus went through, you know, most of his analysis was how much of the IOs were ZHPF 
IOs um, once uh, implemented. And uh, so I'll start there with this customer's data, and then we'll go into what performance effects going from, you know, no ZHPF to, to with ZHPF. So on this slide 24, um, of course, okay, this is production data for a customer, and it's not exactly clean, but uh, for data analysis, we'll, we'll take it because it's an actual result versus lab results. But what I want to point out here is this is a week's worth of data, and in the middle of the week, I think it's a Wednesday, uh, the customer converted all his LPARs to um, ZHPF. Well, it turns out that he did have one of the LPARs on one of the KECs, He's, uh, this chart is, uh, you know, for the whole week with the percentage of ZHPF from the channel's point of view for the two different KECs that they have in the configuration. In the first half, where it's supposed to be, you know, low or no ZHPF, we actually had one, one uh, LPAR active. So we're not going to see the full benefit uh, in response time, you know, before and after, but uh, I'm guessing, estimating about 75%. So so the numbers that I'm going to show you are going to be a little conservative compared to what they actually would be for this uh, this customer. Uh, when I looked at the back half of the week, this is uh, Thursday, Friday, 48-hour uh, average. You know, we show in each individual RMAP interval on this uh, vision chart, but just to give you you know a number or a set of numbers, the average was uh, from the channel perspective 78%. Uh, the minimum interval, these are 15 minimum intervals, was 58%, and the maximum was 90, 91%. Um, <clears throat> and Paulus's analysis for this previous customer uh, was to show ZHPF candidates because the ZHPF was not turned on. This slide here is to compare, you know, pretty much the previous slide to what uh, our predictive analysis is with the Type 42 data. In Paul's case, he did not get, you know, 97% of the IOs captured. This, in this case, we did. So it's it's very very good capture ratio. His lipolysis was lower. This is a type 42 data, and this is new to Vision 7.2. In Paul's charts, he showed by DSS, but in Vision, you can also show by essentially data set type. It's an interesting. Um, view of activity. This is again a 24-hour summary um, and here we have, this is actually taken a year later because we went back in time to get the before and after around the time period. So a year later, so we have ZHPF percentages from just a type 42 data was 87 percent. Uh, the 74.5, the DSS or DIS subsystems will report in the performance counters uh, IOs that are ZHPF reads and ZHPF writes. And so looking at that data, we had 87, also 87 percent, so very close correlation. And uh, for the type 73 data, which is the channel data, which was on the previous slide, uh, after we excluded Z, uh, ZVM IOs, they're not uh, ZHPF candidates, but they show up in the charts and so are kind of watering down from a MVS point of view or ZOS point of view, the percentages, once we compensate for that, it's also very close, 86 percent. So for this customer, we had good agreements for predictive capability of uh, uh, penetration for ZHPF versus the actual. And, you know, the data will show you the, the advantages of 78 percent, which is probably 81 percent when we uh, subtract out the ZH. Uh, ZH or ZVM data, and uh, and uh, a year <clears throat> later it, it had increased. Now whether that was a change in workload or just a workload variation, I can't tell you because I don't have the the trending analysis that we could do uh, if we had a full year's worth of data from the customer. All right, so that was the penetration. Keep in mind, 78 percent. Now we'll do the channel comparison on slide 27. Uh, I'm looking at what I consider the most um, germane measurement from the channel in terms of uh, improvements expected from ZHPF. You think about channel reporting, performance statistics, 
we have microprocessor utilization, that's what's on the chart, but there's also uh, efficiency or utilization of bandwidth, and there's also a utilization of the backing bus, the PCIe buses behind the channels. So of those three metrics, the one that's most relevant for um, ZHPF comparison is the microprocessor utilization. And that's, uh, Paul also showing that on the previous uh, customer slides about that, this utilization. So here we're more channel rich than what uh, Paul has had. In fact, the configuration is uh, for the two CACs. Each CAC has 16 channels for each of the DSSs in the configuration. There's five DSSs. So this is a channel rich configuration, yet what we want to show is what effect did ZHBF have when it was implemented uh, in the middle of the week compared to the previous week. So this is a, a, like a side-by-side -side comparison that the Vision uh, product will give you. The right-hand side is the um, two days where uh, ZHBF was active on all the LPARs, you know, on both CACs. And the left-hand side is uh, t the other two days in the week uh, I think this is Monday, Tuesday versus Thursday, Friday. And visually, you can see uh, that the averages obviously dropped for um, microprocessor utilization, and that's not unexpected because what ZHPF is doing is improving, lowering the protocol overheads and improving the control data command structure to increase its efficiency. So on a given I.O. rate, the utilization for a channel will decrease as you go from FICON I.O. to ZHPF I.O. So if I average these numbers, just to give you a figure of merit, uh, and look at the relative percentage of microprocessor drop, it dropped 53 percent. And this is was the 78 or maybe it's 82 percent utilization when I subtract out uh, ZVM IOs, but anyway, 53% uh, utilization drop with this uh, ZHBF implementation, which is very significant. Uh, in talking to the customer, they were definitely excited to see this and had mentioned that they'll probably double up uh, the channels on the next um, deployment of the uh, next generation of uh, disk storage subsystems. They'll probably go with half the number of channels that they have today. The peak, however, if you notice on the right-hand side, is still close to the top. It's an afternoon spike. Uh, we'd have to investigate what's going on there, but the uh, uh, absolute maximum still did drop by roughly uh, 20%. Now, so the, uh, the last chart was a channel comparison. Now we have an, uh, uh, some metrics that were just based on a disk storage subsystem. And uh, one uh, aspect of ZHPF is that uh, it does Im improve the efficiency of transport, transporting you know, large amounts of data. In this channel rich configuration, I don't, wouldn't think there's any latent demand in the FICON only or mostly FICON case on the left hand side. Uh, on the right hand side is uh, with ZHPF. But I thought, well, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that within a 15-minute interval we may get, like in the peak batch time period, we may get higher throughputs. So this chart is to just compare the, the maximums for two days after ZHPF on the right and before, mostly before ZHS, ZHPF is implemented on the left. And the maximums did increase, you know, 15, 16 percent maximum throughput. That's megabytes per second. So these uh, ZHBF helps uh, larger data transfer change, larger records, and longer chains uh, compared to FICOM because of the improvements in the protocol. So that's, uh, you know, to be determined if this is a long-standing benefit for the customer, we'd have to look at probably a month's worth or a couple months' worth to see if the maximums are uh, have increased after ZHBF. But, uh, the first week of data looks like it's positive for the um, when the <clears throat> high bandwidths are required by the applications uh, and for their workload. So let me go on to slide 30. This is response time. So 
the benefit of the HPF uh, besides reducing utilizations of the microprocessor, and I showed you microprocessor utilizations on the channel side. There's also benefits of microprocessor utilization on the host adapter side of the storage uh, subsystem. But uh, bottom line is, besides channel consolidation, which is a you know hardware cost savings that Paul showed. You know, what benefit does this new technology ZHPF have on my, my applications that I'm running? So the overall metric uh, to look at is average response time. And this has many components, uh, one of which is, uh, is what ZHPF is really focused on, which is connect time. But on average, for these two days after versus two days before ZHPF, we did see a drop in average I/O response time, seven, eight percent. Not huge, you know, from an average response time point of view, but certainly a nice benefit for paying the, you know, microcode the license fees for the uh, ZHPF and just turning it on. And this is, I think I neglected to mention, this is phase one implementation, so it had both. Um, the media manager, the first phase zero one, and the sequential uh, piece that uh, IBM calls phase phase one. So we had both pieces in this uh, before after case. Going on to slide 31, this is the connect time. Now connect time, it, you know, before in the previous slide, it's hard visually to see any benefit. So I did the, the 48 hour averages here. It's pretty obvious that connect time has dropped from the Monday, Tuesday time frame without Z, ZHPF to uh, Thursday, Friday with ZHPF. And here, the figure of merit for the 48-hour average, average connect time dropped 24%. And so ZHPF is, is focused on the protocol when, that, when you're actively communicating to the storage subsystem between channel and host adapter. And so we're seeing nice benefits, not only in reduced utilizations, but also uh, reduced connect time, translates into response time, translates into application benefit. So, uh, so kind of a summary for this uh, before and after study for ZHBF. We did get 78% of the IOs uh, using ZHBF after the cutover. Uh, a year later, it was up to 86%, and that was a little bit of massaging with the eliminating the ZVM part. I think it was 83% from the channel statistics and then one year after. But anyway, uh, good news for, uh, you know, taking advantage of the ZHBF technology for their uh, utilizations in the microprocessor and lowering the uh, response times and connect times. So there's good correlation in our uh, vision tool between ZHBF candidate analysis from the type 42 and the actual percentage of ZHBF. And just uh, high level numbers to reemphasize the microprocessor utilization on the channel reduced 53%, that's a relative amount, and the uh, I.O. response time reduction back to the application 7% and the part that ZHBF affects 25%. So I'll move on to a uh, coupling facility, uh, which is an interesting result and a, and a great uh, kind of like a side effect benefit that we'll get at the end here. And <clears throat> let me just say that in the previous one, ZHBF, you know, I spent my IBM career on this performance. And I would say I'm a subject matter expert there. Uh, coupling facility, I have awareness of that. But the nice thing about vision is that even though you're not a subject matter expert, it gives you the ability to see, you know, issues and help resolve them. So you don't have to spend, you know, 30 years of your career, 10 years of your career, understanding the ins and outs of every aspect of a of um, performance in the, on the mainframe and, and still get a lot of benefit from the uh, vision tool. So with that, uh, keeping in mind I'm not a, really a subject matter expert for coupling facility, but uh, this is a very compelling use of the vision tool and you'll see this uh, shortly. So uh, this customer uh, that we're going to show you here, different from the previous two, was using uh, logical CFs uh, in their uh, environment, very happy, you know, applications were good, you know, there's no 
no one was complaining. You know, it's a typical thing. You see, okay, we're going to implement something and we're we'll save some money on the hardware and uh, uh, deploy the applications. Application people aren't complaining. Everybody's happy, right? So uh, what this does, and this was, um, you know, sort of a, um, a benefit from using the vision tools that the customer uh, could look at uh, the coupling facility data and say, hmm, vision is telling me that I have some uh, problems here. The red uh, circle says uh, we're kind of in the uh, exception reporting. So even though everything is well, uh, maybe there's something there I can improve and we'll get some residual benefit even though the application guys aren't crying. So we're going to concentrate on the columns uh, service time for uh, synchronous requests and uh, we get a side benefit service time for asynchronous requests. So let me go on to the next slide. And this is a drill down from the previous slide and it shows one of the CFs uh, on the previous slide. And for each uh, dot, let me just go back just to show you. For each uh, dot here, there's, a, there's 12 uh, dots. The blue is for uh, workload only, and that's not rated. And then green, good, yellow, uh, trending bad, and red, you're in trouble, ex you know, um, exception reported, right? So the greens are good, red is, red's not good, and each one of these, has a time axis in the next chart. So we picked one of those. And it, we can see down here in the lower left-hand corner, service time for synchronous and an asynchronous request. Those are quite far out of, uh, out of um, um, our thresholds of, uh, for, for service time for synchronous requests. It's a 30 uh, microsecond. Uh, threshold for a warning and 60 microseconds for uh, exception. So we're blown by that by two orders of magnitude. The, the asynchronous regress, well some of the long running synchronous ones turn into asynchronous, but uh, for the most part they're not consuming the microprocessor. The difference between synchronous and asynchronous is the processor on the server, the CP, uh, gives up uh, waits for a synchronous request but then but gives up and goes on to something else on an async. So the sync and async results to the requesting use of the coupling facility and message facility there, whether the the CP stays around and waits for the response back or goes on. So go on to the next slide. Uh, this is a drill down from the previous slide just to show you one of those. And so we have added details so you can kind of get a look. See, and these are the systems on the SIS 1, 3, 2, and 0 is what we labeled them, and how much time is spent on average for this uh, synchronous request for the coupling facility. So this is uh, these slides at the end here, you see how it drops down. You kind of get kind of the answer we're going to have is that this dynamic dispatch equals thin was something that the customer in consulting with IBM kind of find out, well, this, this is a relatively recent improvement for logical coupling facilities. And once it was implemented, then the synchronous uh, response time dropped significantly. And we'll show you sort of a transitional phase between uh, no uh, dynamic dispatch equals then to one of the sysplexes doing that versus all of them. This is the all of them part here. So uh, let me go on. So besides the uh, synchronous, we're also looking at async uh, response time requests. There's also uh, very poor in the before case uh, with the dynamic dispatch not set to thin. Uh, and this, uh, so we're going to see some benefit here. And this is sort of this was unexpected to us, but uh, as a nice improvement for their uh, their uh, applications. All right, so uh, this this is a, a you know twelve up slide chart. We put uh, the customer went through you know I think he had two or maybe three sysplexes that he had to go through, and they just used a, a set dynamic dispatch equals thin to just one of the sysplexes. And what we noticed was that even though the coupling facility is shared, uh, we did get uh, significant and noticeable improvements. 
across uh, all of the cisplexes when this happened because um, essentially the time to, to do the uh, requests that are not have not been thinly dispatched uh, improved. So we got about half, roughly half the improvement here uh, by only doing one of I think three uh, cisplexes. And this just shows the detail of the synchronous requests uh, in that time period where we went from this part is no uh, dynamic uh, dispatch equals thin, and this is one of the three cisplexes dynamic dispatch equals thin. All right, and this is uh, the companion chart from the, the drill down of the 12 up for the asynchronous request where we've got one of uh, three cisplexes with uh, the ultimate solution dynamic dispatch equals thin. Now this is sort of an overall chart. Um, this <coughs> chart should look familiar on the left hand side. This is a side by side comparison of our um, dashboards, which is a nice way of looking, okay, our, once we made the, the change, which is dynamic dispatch equals thin, uh, how do I compare at a dashboard level? Is, it, is all things green or we still got some problems? And it turns out, you know, even things unrelated to specifically for the response time of requests, either uh, sync or async, uh, were also improved with this change at dynamic dispatch equals thin. So now, all of the metrics, uh, 11 metrics that are rated, are now in the green with dynamic dispatch equals thin just by doing that uh, across all three cisplexes. Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, the synchronous uh, request side-by-side -side comparison. We see the before case where two of the four systems were fairly very high up on the uh, synchronous request time, you know, almost a mill, 1.1 1, 1 .1 milliseconds, you know, 1,000 microseconds. And on the right-hand side, very hard to see what this is, but you can see it's much improved. So the next slide will show you what that right-hand side of the chart is, and we see that the average time to do the synchronous request even with a logical coupling facility had dropped to under uh, 20 microseconds. So this is a very good number for um, you know, even uh, no sharing of coupling facility um, hardware uh, across the displexes. So this is, it got it back into pink. And they, you know, still maintain the savings they had while not uh, spending more uh, IT spend on their coupling facility hardware. Now, you know, all that is like for latency is very well and good, but you know, the applications weren't complaining in the first part, so why, you know, why spend the trouble to do, it, to do this? And, you know, me being in performance for a very long time, all I like to improve things, even if uh, the customer users may not be aware of, of the benefit, it's just good practice. But the additional benefit is by improving the sync uh, response times, we actually saved, you know, you know, significant CP or the regular uh, CPU uh, utilizations. And so this is a side-by-side uh, -side before and after of the, you know, CP usage uh, milliseconds per second. So 1,000 milliseconds would be, uh, uh, per second would be one complete CP, as an example. And these are by all the systems that are uh, across the three um, cisplexes. And the after case, we dropped roughly about half a CP's worth. So we, uh, in terms of uh, microprocessors or CPU utilization. So if you had four CP's and one of them, almost one of them was used completely, uh, utilized waiting for the coupling facility to respond to these synchronous requests. Well, now you've dropped that to be only half, half a CP. So it's a very good story for CPU utilization, and that benefit can translate into you know, delaying the upgrades for the, the mainframe tax or possibly lower software licensing fees. It just depends on what, uh, what you're running at the time. So this, this was a side effect that was very positive to see because even if the you know, the users aren't complaining, application folks aren't complaining. Saving CPU resources uh, is a very big deal and uh, only really possible in this case 
by having vision showing that you know you had a significant problem and that was uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, request to the coupling facility. So uh, and that result is we the logical uh, coupling facility usage. You know service levels are met, but you know we saw some, through predictive analysis that there were some issues. Uh, the recommendation after getting subject matter experts involved was use dynamic dispatch equals thin and both sync and async uh, response times improved significantly and we cut uh, CP usage you know very measurable about a half a CP's worth in this uh, client's case or customer's case so a very positive story and uh, sort of pays for the tool all right thank you no thank you Joe uh, appreciate um, your input. I appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, um, so you've seen the, the ZHPA and coupling facility, how that can have a significant impact on both cost and performance. And uh, hopefully you've, you've gotten a feel for how IntelliMagic can has some un unique abilities to to uh, to help you get that visibility of uh, in, into your environment. So if you have uh, some questions about you know um, either the the content that was created uh, and presented today or about how it uh, might be applicable to your environment, please uh, contact us at that phone number there or shoot me an email. We can get some people together and do a presentation for your team. And um, obviously, you know, we're, we're in business to provide these kind of solutions, whether it's as a services engagement or uh, you know, on software that you can, you can access on an ongoing basis. So again, thank you very much for your time today. There will be a, a recorded version of this that we'll send to you uh, by email. Uh, afterwards. And if you're uh, in Pittsburgh uh, in about 10 days time, please come by and see us there.